Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special, Episode 190. March the 7th, 2014, South by Southwest Interactive, Day 1. Welcome to South by Southwest coverage on TWIT. We have a special that we are going to be hosting today and tomorrow and Tuesday. We were joined, I'm Tanya Hall, and we're joined by Sarah Lane, the Sarah Lane. Um, Hello, Tanya. Hello. Good morning from my home. (laughs) <laughs> from your home. <laughs> this is your home away from home here, yes. which is where I am. And yes. um, we are up early because we are talking about South by Southwest and what's happening and the fact that it is a big event. Um, we're not there this year, but Sarah, you've been for several years. Um, tell us, you know, how many years in a row did you go to South by Southwest? Well, uh, last year was the first year that I hadn't gone in seven years. So it started in I don't know. Uh, Math is hard. Uh, 2006, uh, I think, was my first year, 2007. And, yeah, so it kind of became part of my this is what I do in March um, uh, 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 routine. Uh, No matter where I worked, it always seemed to make sense. Obviously, working in tech, uh, there are lots of reasons to go to South By and meet other people and, and watch panels. But I definitely do think that I watched it change over those seven years um, to the point where I made a conscious decision last year not to go. Um, And I have to say, I was kind of relieved. That sounds a little bit weird, but um, I think that for some people who have been there for a while, you know, and it makes me sound like an old lady saying, get off my lawn, it's not the show it used to be. (laughs) But it really has changed. And I don't want to say it's changed for the worse, but it's gotten bigger. And the... The, the vibe of the show is different to me now. You know, it's funny. Last year, I think they said 35,000 people, um, you know, poured into to Austin for the event. Now, South by Southwest, um, if you haven't, if you don't know this already, it's interactive, which is digital, it's, it's marketing, it's startup, it's all that kind of stuff. So a week of interactive-ish, and then you've got music and you've got film. So there's a lot happening. Um, it's not just about the digital end, the technology end of things. But that's what we're going to be talking about. And I I would agree that there's so many people, and that's typically what I hear, Sarah. And I've covered the event, but I've never actually physically been to Austin for the event. And part of that is because I found that you can actually get a lot of information, but I'm not really into the big party scene. I know that may talk about sounding old, uh, but I'm just not really big into the party scene. So that was something that I didn't feel like I was going to miss out on. And I totally get that you... um, you felt a little, you know, relieved, but we still, it's still an important event. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of um, speakers. There's a lot of events that you can attend. And we're going to be joined uh, by Marshall Kirkpatrick, who has been a guest on Twit before. And he's actually at South by Southwest Interactive. And welcome, Patrick, to the show, Marshall Kirkpatrick. Hi there, Tanya. Sarah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be at South by Southwest and to to uh, share the good news about it with your viewers. Well, here's the thing. Um, you know, there's so many different events. Marketing is a really big part of it. That's what's what you're actually going to be speaking about. Um, you've got your own uh, session that's going to be a classroom, right? Um, tell us about the digital marketing workshop. Yeah, so I'm super fortunate to be Uh, co-presenting a half-day workshop on digital marketing on Saturday with some folks from Salesforce and Omnicom. And uh, my little company, Little Bird, will be represented there. And I'm going to be talking about uh, adding value and hustling and making it a habit uh, to to share good content and and be a a good faith contributor to the social web uh, as a, a marketing tactic and strategy there on Saturday. And it's going to be a long one. Uh, there's a couple hundred pe- people registered. We're going to be there for four or five hours. It's going to be awesome, but overwhelming, just like the rest of the event. Well, now here's the thing. You know, I'm interested in marketing, but what makes your um, session or what makes it so important to keep up with um, with the th- types of things that you're going to be talking about? What is somebody going to get out of your presentation, uh, a big takeaway that you're, you're expecting people to have? Well, we're going to have a real breadth of 
of topics covered from agency and enterprise tactics, uh, but I'm really going to be sharing a lot of my personal uh, practices and lessons learned from uh, my career building up uh, blogs and startups just with my bare hands and social media tools. And, uh, and usually when I give that kind of presentation, people are able to walk away with a, a real solid set of, of tips and tricks and tools and fun that they can go and uh, put to use in growing their own careers and social capital uh, for the benefit of the, their employers. What's one tip? Um, give us, give us, a, give us a, a spoiler alert. What's one tip that they're going to get from your class? Sure. So I really like to suggest that people oversubscribe to inbound streams of information. Just keep them coming uh, and then set up filtering tools to, uh, to look for, uh, for emerging news events or things that you can add unique value to. Uh, to reshare back out to your audience of folks uh, and uh, make yourself a, a source of, of interesting, high-quality information. But that when you, oversubscribe and filter uh, is, is one of my favorite tactics. So when you say oversubscribe, um, what kind of social networks are you talking about primarily? Well, I really love uh, Twitter and blogs. Um, I enjoy Google Plus and, and Facebook, but for me, Twitter is such a great source of early information uh, on niche subjects um, that I, I follow 10,000 people on Twitter myself, and I just dip my head into that river of news uh, throughout the day. But then I create little filters like Twitter lists, and I use our product, uh, Little Bird, to filter by expertise. Uh, and I, I just look for hot stuff to discover early and reshare out with other people. And uh, wash, rinse, and repeat that practice, and I've been able to, to make a career out of doing that myself. And I think that it's a, a really accessible practice that lots of people can can do too. Wash, rinse, and repeat is kind of interesting. Now you have gone from the reporting side, so you you were at Read Write Web, which is can be a tongue twister. Now you're the CEO of a startup that's doing great things. Why would you recommend somebody attend South by Southwest, whether they're a journalist? or they're interested in being in the tech startup space? Well, it's just a lot of fun to, as my wife, Michalina, puts it, meet the people who make the internet. Uh, I got to share a cab with Barry Tunde Thurston, formerly of The Onion, on the way back from the airport. And then I went and ate tacos uh, with some awesome people that I have long admired from online. And just walking down the street, you see people who, who used to be a Twitter avatar to you, and now you get to hang out with them in person. And that's always been the case, and it's just happening at scale now. But people have been saying for years, oh, South by Southwest is getting too big uh, for the past seven or eight years, and it just keeps getting bigger. Uh, but I, I think it's just more fun. Well, you know, I encourage people to attend your class. I've certainly enjoyed being connected to you myself for quite a period of time. Um, I love, you talk about over, over subscribing. I've been following you for a while. I, I really appreciate you taking the time out to jump in on us and our coverage. We'll be following you in your class. And um, thanks for joining us, Marshall. Enjoy South thank, By. Thank you, Tanya. It's nice to see you and nice to see you too, Sarah. Have a good you week. You too. Enjoy those veggie barbecue zucchinis. Mm, I will. <laughs> <Make that Thanks. laughs> okay, so Sarah, I mean, marketing yes. is a really big part. You talk on your um, your the social hour about social media and marketing and, and kind of how people are using it. What, and, and, and he's talking about this event getting bigger and bigger. What, why, why then wouldn't you want to attend to, you know, make connections, learn more about how to be a better marketer? I mean, does it make sense to kind of just try to bypass the parties or, I mean, well, um, I, I will say on the social hour, Amber is much more of the marketing expert of the two of us. Um, I am more of, <laughs> of a, of a I, I would say, enthusiastic social consumer of news um, and, and certainly in on the conversation. But Marshall makes a really good point. If you're in Austin to make connections and be able to shake someone's hand and say, oh, wow, name to a face. That's so cool. It's really nice to see, see us all in one place. That's a great reason. I do think, though, that 
it is, it, in my opinion, 35,000 people in one place. Um, Austin is not a huge city, um, and it's sort of a bustling, uh, interesting city anyway. That's too many. Um, I think that the, the conference uh, area itself, which is right smack dab in the middle of town, is uh, sort of a nightmare because there are just too many people uh, trying to figure out where their panels are and, oh, we got to go to room B and what floor is it on? The conference center is quite large. So all of that is great, but you kind of have to have a map um, ahead of time. And I know that there is a trend, at least in uh, friends of mine, that have stopped even buying badges because there's so much going on outside of the official parties where you would need a, an interactive badge or the panels where, of course, you need a badge to get into the to the conference center, um, that it, it's almost turned into kind of this, like, backlash against the official organizers where people are doing their, their own stuff. And that really makes it confusing because then you start having to choose, oh, it's Saturday at 8 p.m., what am I going to do? Because there's five cool things that I could choose from. And I don't know, being overwhelmed with a choice like that starts to feel um, kind of like you're at a big music concert and you have to choose between your two favorite bands, you know? Like, <laughs> I hate that. Well, there always seems to be a lot of, of hype and a lot of, um, you know, crazy, you know, events happening and parties. And I think people do get a little distracted. But again, there's, like you said, there's there's the paid events. There's the things that you have to actually um, have a badge. And there's a lot of free events. And there's things that you can actually watch online. Um, I think one of the things that we want to make sure that we, you know, let people know is that if there is an event that you're interested in um, and you can't attend and you're not in Austin, I recommend, you know, connecting with the person using uh, social media. Um, but there is an event that I want to get to. We've got another guest joining us, Jason. Torchinsky. He is a presenter and his uh, presentation is Will Hackers and Makers Save Car Culture? Welcome, Jason. We'll the see. headless Jason. <laughs> I'm here. Sorry about that. The, that's okay. Well, we car culture. Is that what I think? Yes, pop yes. Or car? Oh, okay, good. I know nothing about pop culture. No, no, no. Car culture. So I think when you kind of dipped down. Okay, <laughs> so now you're in yeah, Austin, sorry, yeah. right? Right now? No, I'm not yet. I'm going to Austin um, uh, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow. I'll be in. Right now I'm in Los Angeles, See, the Austin of California. And you were up late, so you just got a few hours of sleep. That's not, you're not really uh, getting ready for the event if you're not like stocking up on your sleep before you head out there, right? That's a new, well, yeah, I just, um, I do a lot of bad planning and I have a toddler, <laughs> so um, uh. that all means I That'll do it. So tell us, um, will hackers and makers save car culture? I'm self-driving cars on the cheap. What is what is what is your uh, presentation about? Well, basically, there's this kind of common perception that modern cars are unhackable. That cars have gotten so complex and difficult to work on that the average backyard mechanic and tinkerer can't really do anything with them anymore. But the thing is, that's just not true. There's actually we have more tools now in many ways than we've ever had before to really uh, tweak and play with cars and make cars interesting. I write for a website called Jalopnik, uh, the finest automotive website uh, available. And um, we have a lot of people there who work with vintage cars and new cars. And the, like I said, the common thought is that vintage cars you can tweak and modify. And there's still a perception that modern cars, you can't do that. But... Like I'm saying, there's there's a lot of ways you can, but there's still also a lot of ways, a long ways to go as well. So why is this an important event for somebody to attend? What are they what is the one takeaway that they're gonna get from attending your presentation? That you should consider your car something that you can actually modify and hack and tailor to your own needs as much as possible. The takeaway here is even with the looming advent of um, uh, you know autonomous cars and a lot of news outlets talking about how car culture is dead, that's just not true. Car culture isn't even remotely dead, and there's all kinds of interesting things that can happen. And if we're going to have a real relationship with the vehicles that carry us around, we need to see these things as things that can be personalized and modified and really enjoyed for something more than just the most basic of commuting use. Is this your first uh, time at South by? I mean, do you have you attended before? This will be my first time at South by Southwest, yes. So why are you there? I mean, why why is it important for you to be a presenter at South by? I mean, what, what provoked you to do this? 
Well, I was actually contacted by uh, uh, two other people, uh, John and uh, Rob, these who were the, my co-presenters on the panel, John, Rob Edwards and John Dorman. Um, they actually uh, had arranged to um, do this car hacking panel, and they wanted someone from the auto journalism side who covers a lot of car hacking and has done a little uh, car hacking as well. So it's a you know, they were the ones who approached me, but it's important to us and us at Jalopnik because we believe very much in the power of car culture. We believe cars are such a huge part of our lives as it is that it doesn't make sense to just treat them like these necessary evils or these tools that you just, you know, appliances that you just get in and get out of. There's so much more than that. People don't treat cars the way they treat other things. And being able to modify your own car and change it to meet your own personal needs is very important. And it's been something that people have been doing with cars since we've had cars. Actually, I'm sure even in the era of horses, if people could have grafted on extra legs and a secondary brain, they would have done that. Um, but that usually ended up in horse death. But once cars came around, people have always tinkered with them and modified them and made them their own. And that's always been a huge part of what makes car culture great. Um, and I know modern cars are more complex. They're better than they ever have been. Uh, so people have gotten there's this perception of an inaccessibility. But like I said, there's all kinds of interesting tools, you know, whether you have a new car or an old car, to make things really interesting and do things on your own. And we have ways of doing things now with the Internet that allow you better information, the ability for your car to talk to other cars, to get data from your car to use for other purposes, whether it's technical or art or whatever you want to do. It's, it's a fascinating platform to work with. You know, I appreciate you uh, connecting with us. I'm really excited to follow you and what you're doing in the automotive space. Um, keep, you know, because that's a big controversial topic, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of feel like getting an old car and uh, making sure that it's not too tech uh, is, isn't necessarily a bad thing. So, but thank you so much for joining us and um, enjoy South by Southwest. I'll do what I can. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, our next guest just uh, just joined us. He's actually presenting in at 11 Central Time. So we've got him for a few minutes. And um, we're, he's going to actually present on Teeny Tiny Video, Great Big Impact. That's Michael Hoffman, the CEO of C3 Communications. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. So you're actually at the presentation area. You're getting ready to present. What is Teeny Tiny Video, Great Big Impact? What is that? Well, we're looking at the um, explosion of these really super short videos that are out there today. So uh, Vine and Instagram and Mixbit, these different uh, phone-based apps that let you create videos that are six seconds long or 15 seconds long. Um, and, and they're just exploding in terms of popularity. And so the question that we're looking at is, can we use these videos for social good? And if so, how can we do that? Well, that's a great question. And I think, you know, the, the question people too wonder is, so how do, you, how do you make a video that's going to impact somebody and keep it really short? Like, what are the key ingredients that you need to have? Well, I think that you can't expect a six second video, for example, to tell uh, the entire story or the entire uh, history of your organization or something. You need to find very small bits that are really, in a way, teasers that get someone interested in something. So a good example might be a thank you. You can say thank you to donors or say, hey, we're trying to raise a million dollars and we've gotten to $867,000. Like that's something you can say in six seconds um, as an update. So there are um, lots of different ways to do it, but you need to really have something that fits the format. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Does it need to be funny? I mean, you know, does it need to have a cat in it? You know, Sarah's already introduced a cat into this coverage. Um, how important is that? <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually haven't seen that many of these with cats, but there are some things that they are good for or, or you know, better for. So, for example, with Vine videos, stop motion is a great thing to do with those videos. So you can um, you can uh, take cut out paper, for example, and have something that looks like it's uh, telling its own story or letters that come together. And it's basically you're just stopping and starting the camera. And so there's some really neat effects that you can get with using this stop motion technique. So is there a, a length um, that the video needs to be? I mean, should it be, you know, seconds long? Should it be minutes? Or, or is there too much um, time that you can put into a video? 
Oh yeah, I mean it depends on on what platform you're using, but we're going to be talking today mostly about Vine and Instagram. And Vine has a six second just about uh, li limitation, so videos are just a slightly longer than six seconds. Um, Instagram is 15 seconds, um, and Instagram is owned by Facebook, um, and the 15 second video fits very nicely in Facebook's uh, video strategy and mobile strategy. And with Vine, Vine is owned by Twitter. Um, and the six seconds is like a tweet. Uh, and so it's the video version of a tweet. Sarah, you use Instagram. Do you create videos? On Instagram, I, I've i probably uploaded three of the thousands of, of uploads um, on, on Instagram. And I think the reason for that is because I find it a lot more challenging to sort of be artsy and creative, which is usually the point of me using Instagram uh, via video, which is funny because we do video for a living, but um, I find it um, to have a very short, self-contained something is more of a challenge uh, with video, but that's also what makes it very compelling when it's done right. Um, Vine is a whole nother beast, really, um, and I, I actually really don't use Vine at all, but I'd certainly consume it, and I'm always... I think when you see something that is done well, it's um, it's sort of shockingly done well uh, because you appreciate the fact that somebody put a lot of effort into something that is so short, you know, and the looping element is is uh, becoming a, a, a medium that we're all getting used to. And sometimes that has an additional impact and it's 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 fun to watch it evolve. OK, Michael you know, what's the return on investment? We know we're being asked to do it. You see a lot of the morning shows are are asking asking uh, viewers to send in their Instagram. Um, so what's the return on the time that you put into it and engaging with your customers? Are you seeing any actual numbers? Um, it's too new to, to know, really. And I, I think I would put this and the question of the ROI, you know, for, from this in the same bucket as I would for other social media things, new digital tools. So, you know, what's the ROI from your Facebook page, from your email list, from other things? Some of those things are more direct than others. Um, I think it's really about engagement. So do we, how are we engaging our audience over time? What are they able to do? How do we move them along some path? These are just new tools. So the tools don't change your mechanisms for measurement or um, your, you know, the reason that you need to understand those things. So those are still there. So I would say, don't look at this as like business rules have changed. Just look at this as another platform and you have to decide, do you want to play in that or not? You, most of the time, you don't need to be the first ones in the pool, right? You can see how things shake out. But I think if you do digital content, you need to be looking at these, at these new tools and you need to just be playing with them. You don't have to make big investments. That's one of the nice things about these platforms is, um, you know, they're, they're on your phone. There's no big equipment investments. There's no big, you know, you can shoot a buy video in six seconds, right? Uh, a more effective one will probably take you some planning time uh, and the like, but um, you should be playing with it to understand it. You should be consuming it to understand it. Um, and, you know, we, these, this world of digital media is changing rapidly all the time. So this is just a way to keep up with that. Absolutely. What's your, what's your social media platform of choice? If you had one, one social media outlet, what would that be? Well, I think right now, I mean, we see that Facebook dominates just in terms of attention. So if you're talking about social media, I think you gotta, you gotta start with a Facebook um, strategy, but you really need to understand how does that fit into the other things that you're doing? If you're trying to, you know, in, in my world at, at C3, you know, we work with social causes and charities and, um, uh, cause marketing and, you know, and it's a real question of what are we trying to achieve and what's the best way to do that. And, and so, uh, you know, that's the most important question up front. And then the other things are tactics. So Facebook is not a strategy. Facebook is just a, a an outlet to connect with your constituents. And the question has to be, you know, how do we do that? What are we trying to get them to do? Um, and is this going to be an effective way to do that? And how do we measure that that's happening? Well, and, you know, to your point, it is, these are all different um, marketing tactics or ways to reach consumers. And what I find is that um, it, you have to really look at where your customer lives. So not everybody's on Instagram. And if, and if you're targeting, you know, maybe um, 
a younger demographic, maybe that's a good place for you to be. But um, you do really have to look at the platform. Are you going to talk about any of that in your in your uh, presentation today? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things about Vine, for example, is I think a lot of Vine videos are not watched on Vine. Um, you know, Vine is still, you know, it's popular, but it's popular among insiders who have lots of apps and, and gadgets. Um, but a lot of Vine videos are watched on YouTube. So people take compilations of these six second videos, put them together and create a YouTube video out of it. Um, and so, you know, I think where it's created and where it's consumed are not necessarily the same things. You know, so that's something to look at as well that we'll talk about today. Do you, let me ask about YouTube because I think that's a really good point. And I've heard a lot of conversation. Is YouTube still the destination now that you have a lot of other places that you can see online content? Is, is YouTube still as relevant today as it was maybe a few years ago? I'd say absolutely. I mean, I think YouTube is just uh, uh, a, a center of gravity in terms of um, where people are, are watching. YouTube is the second biggest search engine on the web. Um, you know, people start at YouTube and look for content. So, um, and, and we know, and look, Google runs the world in a, in a sense. And we know that, you know, Google's integrating Google Plus into their search uh, and YouTube is connected to search as well. So if you have a goal to be to be uh, found in in Google searches, your YouTube strategy becomes an important piece of that. So I think in terms of relevance, um, you know, we have to say absolutely, you know, that YouTube is a place that you you need to be playing, and and you know more generally with video, right? Video is the content that people are spending the most time on. Cisco estimates that 90% of all the bandwidth on the web will be video within a few years from now, like three years. Um, so it's just, you know, video is where it's at, and, and we're a great example of this right now. Absolutely. So the, the ever controversial Google Hangouts, um, which some companies have used uh, really well and some on a personal basis, but not everyone is on Google and they don't use the Hangouts and they don't go to the Hangouts. How do you, I mean, is that something that you are going to talk about as well or, or what is your opinion on that? Well, Google Hangouts not part of this session that we're doing, um, but I think Google Hangouts is a great tool. And I, I think uh, if you want to be a thought leader, if you want to um, uh, do things uh, where you um, communicate with different people like we're doing today. Hangout is a great tool to, to be able to do that, to then record it, to have that media later on for consumption on your YouTube channel. So I think that's a, uh, and it's at its infancy and not enough people are using it. But I think, you know, if in, in again, among brands or among social causes, being able to um, have reports from the field to do different things that are recorded, that you invite donors in, to see, to meet certain people, um, you know, that's really effective. So I would certainly encourage um, uh, people to learn that tool and, and begin using it. I'm sorry, um, but I have to go because I'm going to be speaking <laughs> in just uh, a couple of minutes and I actually should show up to the room uh, where my <laughs> happen. Well, we really appreciate you joining us this morning and talking about what's going to happen again. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe they didn't get to attend your uh, session, how, what's the best way they can do that? Um, easy. Uh, our the company C C three Communications. It's S E E and the number three. And I'm just Michael at C three dot com. Thanks. Um, or Michael underscore Hoffman in, on Twitter. So there you go. And we'll be tweeting this out as well. And uh, so if you're following me at Tanya Hall Radio or Sarah Lane, uh, be sure to uh, to connect with us. Thanks again, and enjoy South by Southwest. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Absolutely. Sarah, you know, so we've been talking about videos here a lot at, at Twit and, you know, the, the kind of, you know, traditional content that we create and maybe other types of videos. What, what kind of videos really get your attention from a consumer standpoint that actually encourage you to make a purchase? Would it be something educational or something a little bit more like Old Spice? To make a purchase? Tr correct. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Um... <laughs> I'm not sure I, I watch videos Lane. with the intention to make purchases. I can't, I can't think of any. I mean, do you mean like commercials? Well, here's the thing. So this, this is the question. Is there something that you have in your arsenal that you use to get people to tune into your show or, or do you, do you do personal branding at all? I mean, is, oh, you know, yeah. I see. I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, if if it goes the other way, certainly. I mean, if um, 
if I've got a show that we've produced on Twit, obviously I do a lot of programming each week. I feel like it's overkill to send out a link from my personal account every time I've got a new episode up of something because that would be every day, sometimes several times a day. And I know when I um, when I see that behavior from other people, and I don't, by the way, I'm, this is not like life advice for anybody because I think it's different for everybody, but I find... Um, that there's definitely a gauge where I go, oh, too much, too much friend of mine. Um, I, 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 there's, there's too much personal branding going on here. And I never want anyone to think that about me. So I definitely try to be selective. Um, once a week, I'll tweet out a link to my latest i5, for example. Uh, but um, I think that there is a, it's an interesting little fence to try to not um, be on the wrong side of when it comes to being too noisy or too self-promotional. And um, and that is something that I struggle with all the time because I would love everyone to watch every single thing that I do, but I feel like that it's unreasonable to ask over and over. You know, I think, you know, asking somebody to buy your product, asking somebody to buy your book, I think those are really bad things. But educating people about what you do, whether you fix computers and you offer really great tips on that using Vine, using Instagram or whatever tool that's easy for you. Um, you could even create a webcam video. I think those are really powerful. Um, but, you know, I think that is this that would be a good, that would be a class I would actually attend. And I actually know a little bit about that space. You know, there's a lot happening at South by Southwest. There's also some really interesting speakers this week. Sarah, you and I have talked about one that I'm actually paying attention to. Um, Edward Snowden is actually going to be Skyped in for one of the presentations. I'm pretty interested in that. What do you think? You know, I, I'm certainly interested in it, and it's probably the most exciting thing that's happening at South by Southwest, which is kind of funny because obviously he's not going to be there. I'm a little unclear as to why he fits into the conference, um, but but, but I, obviously I'll be I'll be watching it. Um, I know that a friend of mine who uh, works at TechCrunch, her uh, panel has already been moved so that it wouldn't coincide with the Snowden uh, um, uh, interview because they know that no one's going to watch anything except that. And um, yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of scratching my head a little bit as to what the focus will be. But, you know, it's it's an interest. It's a compel. It's probably going to be a compelling thing. I think it is. In fact, we've um, we're going to be talking more about that. And I think it does. It's a perfect fit from the standpoint of the privacy space and journalism and where technology meets the intersection of those things. And um, it, it's you know, it's something that I think we're all still trying to navigate through. I mean, what what kind of, you know, it, it, it kind of makes me think too the two journalists in uh, Russia that um, the TV reporters that I don't know if you're following that that actually uh, walked off the job because they felt like they were being uh, filtered, but not in a very analog way, but not in a very digital way. But that that happens digitally a lot in other countries, and social media has been a tool that allows um, people to get information to find out what's happening, whether it's Twitter or, or another resource, and. Um, government interference can can really change that. And there's a lot of software companies out there that are making uh, technology for governments to, to you know, listen to what you're doing. What do you think about that part of the conference? Is that something you'd be interested in, Sarah? What part of the conference are you asking? The security, the, um, it, where technology meets journalism. And I think, you know, um, some of the, some of the panels I looked at where they're talking about, um, you know, how to how to be a journalist today using technology and then and then the privacy concerns you know i think there there are a lot of really interesting people running really interesting conversations at south by southwest i'm i you know and, and again i know i'm going to sound like a naysayer and it's it's probably in part because i'm not there so it's easy to do that but I'm not sure I need to be in Austin, Texas to have these conversations, particularly because we have tools to have them in a larger uh, uh, arena online. Um, as far as uh, technology and journalism, I mean, that's my life. That's all I do is 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 use these tools and study these tools in order to uh, to be a better communicator. So that part of the conversation is extremely interesting to me. Um, but... Uh, the, the, the sort of security and privacy stuff is, is not really so much 
a concern of mine. Well, it is a concern for me, and it's a concern for a lot of journalists. You know, Sarah, I, I'm interested in following the event. I've, I've really gotten a lot out of it. And even from a networking standpoint, you know, it's funny that people keep talking about, you know, there's great people you can meet. And I do think real life, you know, meeting people in real life is incredibly powerful. But you can also meet them um, online. And uh, certainly Marshall Kirkpatrick was somebody that I'd met online. All of our guests today were, were acquired via social media. And... Um, uh, we're some pretty interesting people. You know, Sarah, I really appreciate you joining um, the chat and getting up and um, having your cup of joe and uh, following South by Southwest on this first day that it's open and a lot's happening over the next few days. Um, but thanks for, for getting up and joining us. Uh, absolutely. You're welcome. Thanks again. And um, we'll be back tomorrow with the special coverage of South by Southwest. Mm -hmm.